Jeremy Taylor is here on his tour for his book. He gave a talk at Duke uh, earlier in the week and in New Mexico yesterday and the day before. And we're finally glad to have him here. Um, he reminded me that I first met him a long time ago. He was at my house when we had a meeting and a party for the gang who organized the original Human Behavior and Evolution Society. That's right. And we since had time to talk when I spent time in London. I've always found him inspirational. And this book, I, I'll just say, I've been promoting because I think it's good and it's interesting. And he does something I'd like to do but probably can't do nearly as well as he's done, which is talk with real patients and talk about their lives and how their diseases influence their lives, and talk with real doctors who are using evolutionary theory, and talk with scientists who are assessing those kinds of things, and weave it all together in a fascinating narrative, each chapter of which informs you about a different aspect about how evolution can improve our understanding and treatment of disease. Well, I won't take any more of his time now except to say that he was a journalist with BBC as a producer and director for about 20 years. He then went independent and he has been doing science journalism his whole life. And now we are thankful that you've turned your energies to writing instead and we look forward to your talk. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Randy. <laughs> now, C can you hear me? Is that, I'm sort of mic'd. Okay, that's brilliant. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Randy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much indeed for coming. Um, uh, there's a very uh, clear reason why I actually thought I'd write this book, Body by what Darwin, and it's because, like many of the scientists in this rather burgeoning field of evolutionary medicine, I believe that modern medicine limits itself because too often it fails to take evolution into account in its explanation of the disease process. So today I'm going to talk about diseases of pregnancy, immune system diseases, and dementia. And I've found personally that approaching all these examples through the eyes of a Darwinian has helped me to interpret or frame the disease process in a fresh and exciting way. A way that I'm convinced will advance medicine and has the potential for radical uh, new directions in treatment. During the book research, I interviewed the most courageous, single-minded and determined woman I think I've ever met. Her name is Priya Taylor and she lives in West London. Priya wanted to start a family as soon as possible after getting married in 2003. And she got pregnant on her honeymoon. But her tiny baby Alexander had to be um, delivered prematurely at 25 weeks, weighing only one pound. And unfortunately, he died two days later. Undaunted, Priya got pregnant again within two weeks. Um, the doctors, however, a few weeks later could detect no fetal heartbeat. She had a dilation and curatage operation to remove fetal and placental tissue and very soon got pregnant again. Another failure was followed quickly by six more, all of which lasted between four and ten weeks. Two months later, she started her first round of IVF. It was to be the first of six, and five of them led to short-lived pregnancies. Finally, her last IVF cycle produced 14 fertilized eggs, of which two were implanted. And after the most turbulent pregnancy you can possibly imagine, during which she lost one of those fetuses, had the neck of her cervix stitched up to stop the loss of the other, and developed a highly normal placenta, she finally gave birth by caesarean section at 35 weeks to the one baby that had survived all this, baby Maya. Now the gynecologist looking after Priya at the time was Jan Brosens, who's now the head of reproductive health at the University of Warwick. And he believes Priya kept losing her pregnancies because she developed a fault in an evolutionary mechanism for embryo quality control. I'd been led to Brosens by David Haig from Harvard, who suspected that Brosens' research could be an example of the genetic conflict theory in pregnancy that he's been working on for the last 20 years. Now, Haig's main point is that the genetic interests of mother, father, and fetus are not identical. Any fetus will, of course, inherit 50% of its genes from its mother, but it will also inherit 50% from its father. And the two copies of every gene a fetus inherits have the propensity to behave differently depending on that maternal or uh, paternal origin. 
Human mothers shoulder much better, bigger metabolic costs in bringing any baby to term and nourishing and caring for it after birth than does the father. Furthermore, every baby a mother brings into the world has to be genetically related to her, but the father's, of course, might be different. So it's in the mother's best genetic interests to temper the investment she makes in any one baby in favor of spreading that investment out over her entire reproductive life. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And it's in the selfish interest of paternal genes in the shape of the fetus and placenta to demand more from the mother than she is inclined to give. For a mother, the loss of one child, however upsetting, can be compensated for by any number of later pregnancies, but for, uh, by any number of partners. But for the fetus and the paternal genes it carries, it's an existential matter, grow or die. And this is what sets the scene for conflict. So evolutionary biologists like Haig uh, would um, expect paternal genes to manipulate the mother into allowing the indiscriminate implantation of embryos and then to give up more food reserves to the ensuing fetus than is in her long-term interest to do. And they'd expect maternal genes to resist that manipulation via evolved mechanisms to counteract it. That was why when I asked David Haig a few years ago if he had any recent examples of the application of his theory in the real world, in his typically thoughtful fashion, he laid a paper trail for me that led right up to Jan Brosen's door. And Brosen's is an expert on recurrent spontaneous abortion. And he, in turn, places great importance on some research published five years ago by Joris Vermeesh of the Catholic University of Leuven, which suggested to him that the conflict between male and female genetic interests can indeed be taken back right to the moment of conception. One of the bugbears of IVF treatment is that many embryos obtained by hormonally stimulating the ovary suffer from genetic abnormality. So there's a very high rejection rate in the search for suitable embryos to implant. Vermeesh investigated this using embryos obtained from perfectly normal, healthy young women only to discover to his astonishment that over 90% of them also suffered from a high level of genetic abnormality. They were, in fact, chaotic. Half of them had no diploid cells at all. Some had chromosomes missing, chunks of chromosomes missing, fragmentations, deletions, or amplifications of genetic material. Well, you would think that such embryos would be totally unviable. But the mystery is that although the preg rate of pregnancy loss in humans is very high at about 70%, it's nowhere near as high as the percentage, 90%, of genetically chaotic embryos. So, if some of these embryos clearly go on to make babies, why on earth do they go through this period of genome chaos in the first place? Well, Rosens believes it's a strategy to make the embryo more invasive. The only other instance of such high levels of genetic abnormality come from aggressive, invasive cancer cells. So the rather unsettling suggestion is that very early embryos can temporarily transition to something rather akin to cancer. Remember, embryos are such aggressive interlopers, they don't even need a uterus. Ectopic pregnancies arise when they manage to implant outside the uterine wall. And in 1997, a girl called Sage Dalton was born outside the womb because her placenta had managed to burrow into a rich blood supply to a benign fibrous tumor in her mother's abdomen. If, Rosens theorized, this was a male genetic strategy to get poor quality or otherwise incompatible embryos to implant, you would expect females to have evolved an effective countermeasure to save wasting precious time and resources gestating unwanted embryos. And they've done this, Brosen says, through the evolution of menstruation and a narrow time window in the menstrual cycle when inf effective implantation can take place. Rosen says that menstruation comes hand in hand with the evolution of a process called spontaneous decidualization, which has specifically evolved 
to allow human mothers uh, to quality control invading embryos. During this pregnancy response, mild inflammation in the uterine wall causes cells to encapsulate and imprison the embryo and recruit immune cells to the site to literally interrogate it for, for, for compatibility. The adaptive value of menstruation is that it preconditions the uterus to temporarily go through these decidual changes and prepare itself to incorporate and then interrogate embryos. The window of receptivity is, for embryos is very small. Most women implant within a narrow window about six or seven days after ovulation. But there are a number of women who implant much later, uh, even up to eight to eleven days beyond. And there's an exponential increase in miscarriage with this late implantation. Brosens believes this is because late implantation misses that crucial window of receptivity in which decidual changes in the uterine wall prepare the mother to envelop and Im uh, Im implanting an embryos. Because that window of receptivity is also a crucial window for embryo recognition and selection, women who allow late implantation, like Priya Taylor, have developed a fault in an evolved female mechanism for embryo quality control that then reveals itself as a reproductive illness. They're super fertile, but sooner or later they'll lose that pregnancy. But how does this immune system interrogation of embryos actually work? Well, we don't really know, and there are a number of competing theories. I think that what we're looking for is a system that allows choice over embryos, discrimination among them. One idea comes from Tamara Tilbergs at Harvard, who has shown that just prior to ovulation, there's a large increase in regulatory T cells which arise in the peripheral circulation, not in the bone marrow. She's also shown that T cells can recognize specific variants in the HLA-C group of human leukocyte antigens that are displayed on sperm and therefore on embryonic and fetal tissue. HLA-C is the only HLA group that's polymorphic in that it can exist in up to 1,600 potential variants. It's the ability of T cells to discriminate amongst these variants, she says, that allows them to react in either a hostile or benign fashion, depending on what those antigens reveal about the compatibility of paternal genes. In the uterus, histocompatibility mismatch is certainly the name of the game. A hostile reaction which reduces the population numbers of Dregs in favor of inflammatory effector T cells is associated with recurrent spontaneous abortion. But because this discrimination and the way it tilts immune tolerance toward or away from embryo survival also operates in the trophectoderm, that part of the embryo that forms the highly invasive human placenta, it can also lead to preeclampsia. All this, of course, has repercussions for the delivery of reproductive health. First of all, so far as IVF is concerned, the search for the perfect embryo may be over. Unless your name is Harrison Ford, you're never going to find the Holy Grail. Equally, this evolutionary research suggests that therapy designed to increase implantation rate, it, it explains why ther therapy designed to increase implantation rate has so far proved dismally unsuccessful. There needs to be research that explains the difference between human rates of pregnancy loss, 70%, remember, and genetically abnormal embryos, 90%. What happens? Do babies develop normally because an embryo discards abnormal blastomeres after successful implantation? There are reports of perfectly healthy babies developing from only one normal blastomere. Or can a genetically abnormal embryo correct itself so that the genetic mosaicism declines over time? Or does the embryo use more genetically abnormal cells to form the, tra the trophectoderm and thus the placenta where such abnormality would aid its invasive growth and reserve more normal cells for making the baby? We yet don't yet know. However, if successful implantation 
and placental and fetal development are at the mercy of effector T-cell and T-reg populations, this also opens up the possibilities for therapy to skew outcomes towards pregnancy maintenance and away from immune defense. Technologies to maintain populations of paternal antigen-specific memory T-cells are being investigated. And this makes complete sense of many observations over the years that preeclampsia is primarily a disease of either first pregnancy or of a change of partner or long interpregnancy gaps. If you get pregnant quickly with a new partner, you may not have built up a sufficient population of antigen-specific Tregs, and that fetus and its placenta may consequently be prejudiced. A long interbirth em interval may mean that immune memory has waned. When a placenta becomes compromised through these sorts of immune mechanisms, preeclampsia will often result. And here, as Keg has shown, a starving fetus will take the battle back to its mother by releasing soluble FMS-like tyrosine kinase 1, mercifully shortened to S-flit by the trade, a potent VEGF agonist, into maternal circulation. This increases resistance in peripheral blood vessels, driving blood, and therefore oxygen and nutrients, into core organs like the placenta. But that high blood pressure can also cause kidney damage and fits and blackouts, and often terminates pregnancy. This mother-offspring conflict has the ability to prejudice the survival of both parties. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room knows about the hygiene hypothesis, now more properly known as the old friends hypothesis, which, of course, is the idea that our health, particularly re with uh, regard to our protection against a range of atopic and autoimmune diseases, depends on an extraordinary evolved relationship between us and our microbiota, the resident friendly bacterial species and helminth parasitic worms in our guts. Now, a lot of people get the hygiene hypothesis wrong, assuming that exposure to dirt and bugs early on in life gives us a type of protective acquired immunity. The idea harks back to David Strachan at St. George's Hospital in London in the 1980s who came up with what he called the grubby brother syndrome to explain why younger siblings were protected from allergies by acquiring postnatal infections uh, that, of course, ran rife in large families. So today, you often get skeptical people saying, well, we've cut out powerful antibacterial products, we let little Johnny play in the dirt, and we let him cuddle his dog, and he still gets asthma. So the hygiene hypothesis must be wrong. However, we now know that something much more profound is going on. And it's not out here on your hands, it's down here in your guts. Because we've been sharing our large intestines with our microbiota for millions upon millions of years. An evolutionary time span over which we humans have been chronically infected with these organisms because they were ubiquitous in the environment. And because, until the advent of modern medicines, they couldn't be got rid of, our ancestors had to learn to tolerate them rather than seeking to eradicate them through permanently raging innate immune systems. Equally, long-term gut parasites, be they bacteria or worms, needed to hide from our immune systems to prevent themselves being attacked. And they found the answer by taking an extraordinary amount of control over the growth and early development of our immune systems. And how they're properly regulated. Sarkis Masmanian at Caltech has pulled together evidence that shows that our microbiota directly influence the development of a whole range of immune cells from their hematopoietic precursors in bone marrow. They shape our immune systems and control central immunity. When they're absent, as in germ-free mouse models, it leads to defects in the populations of several types of immune cells, including the neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophages of our innate immune system, and different types of CD4 plus T cells of our adaptive immune system, like the various helper T cells, natural killer T cells, and importantly for this talk, the regulatory T cells, Tregs, that hold immune action in check and damp down inflammation. 
So our immune systems have evolved in the context of the immunomodulatory effects exerted on us by our microbiota. And so intimate, intimate is the association between us and our gut microbiota that the genes that regulate our immune systems have ended up in the bugs, not in us. Now, this is okay as long as successive generations of us become populated from birth with these friendly organisms. Our immune systems will be properly regulated. But of course, if we don't, our immune systems will run amok. Now, beautifully crafted, evolved mechanisms, like our dependence on gut microbiota for immune health, take millions of years to evolve, and they can become derailed in the blink of an eye by cultural change, like vast improvements in public hygiene, domestic cleaners that kill 99.9% .9 of all household germs, better food processing, and, of course, over-enthusiastic use of antibiotics. We are particularly vulnerable during childbirth. The vagina is ritually populated with the lactobacilli, and as a baby forces its way into the world, it involuntarily ingests them, helping to kickstart its immune system. And a breastfeeding mother transfers over 100 million immune cells every day to her baby, while over 700 species of bacteria have been found in breast milk. These are vertically transmitted from mother to baby by crossing her gut wall and traveling through the lymphatic system to the mam mammary glands. But mothers who can't or won't breastfeed can't help but deprive their babies of this vital source of probiotic bacteria. And bottle-fed babies show high accounts of potentially pathogenic species like Enterococcus and Clostridia. And in present-day America, 50% of mothers coming into hospital to have their babies are immediately given a course of antibiotics, and one-third of deliveries are now by cesarean section, which, of course, short-circuits the vagina completely. And there's plenty of evidence linking birth by C-section to allergies, celiac disease, obesity, type 1 diabetes, and even autism further down the road. Thankfully for us, if culture derails evolution like this, a change in medical culture can put it back on the rails again. We can restore a healthy gut microbiota to babies while these very high rates of C-section persist. Maria Dominguez Bello at Columbia University has shown the way by placing swabs for an hour in the vaginas of women electing for C-section. And when the baby is surgically removed, it's immediately painted with those swabs, first in the mouth, then around the face, and then all over the entire body. This effectively in, uh, infects the baby with lactobacilli and allows the very early development of a healthy gut microbiota and, we hope, a healthy regulated immune system. Sarkis Masmanian says that because antibiotics deplete the microbiota, it leads to transient immune suppression and makes us more susceptible to opportunistic pathogens. He thinks we'll need a new medical approach that combines antibiotics with immunomodulatory microbial molecules as revolutionary combination treatments to address a re-emerging crisis of infectious diseases. I think we'll soon reach an age of microbiota engineering. As we learn to discriminate the complex effects of different species in our microbiota and tailor make microbiotas to fit individual needs. The recent trials here at ASU with fecal transplants of healthy microbiota into children with autism is a prime example of the sort of medical treatments that may well be on their way. Now, I'd like to finish uh, my little talk this afternoon with an example of where an evolutionary model of a disease process has challenged a medical orthodoxy that stood for over a hundred years. Alzheimer's disease was named after Alois Alzheimer in 1905 and first described in the post-mortem brain of one of his dementia patients, Auguste Dieter. The plaques he described uh, between neurons and the tangles he described within them, we now know to be comprised of the beta amyloid protein, 
and the phosphorylated form of the tau protein, respectively. Ever since, Alzheimer's disease research has been dominated by the assumption that these two proteins cause the disease. As a result, over $20 billion has been spent to date by the pharmaceutical industry on medical trials of drugs that either interfere with the production of amyloid or try to clear it out of the brain. And not one of them has been remotely successful. Yet this amyloid orthodoxy rumbles on, even though it's recently been dealt another couple of body blows. Two studies in the US have shown that a large number of people dying in their 70s and 80s and even beyond uh, had pin-sharp cognition in brains absolutely laden with amyloid. And three genome-wide association studies for genetic contributions to late-onset Alzheimer's disease could detect no variation at all attributable to the genes involved in producing amyloid and tau. They did, however, implicate a number of genes involved in the immune system. I met a man called Brian Ross, now in his early 70s, who used to be a senior engineer in the British Army Air Corps. He'd been diagnosed 10 years previously with Alzheimer's and was finding it increasingly difficult to function. He still enjoyed watching documentaries on television, but half an hour after they'd finished, he'd lost all memory of them. And he'd given up reading in frustration because he can no longer pick up a book from where he last left off. His wife, Marie, noticed that something he must have previously done a million times, like changing the fuse in a plug, was now completely beyond him. And she finds the most painful thing of all is that Brian now has great difficulty remembering enjoyable key past events. And she had to fight back the tears as she told me that for her, the whole point of a life together is that it revolves around shared, treasured memories. Memories, of course, that her husband no longer has. Now, Brian is taking part in a trial at the University of Southampton run by the professor of biological psychiatry there, Clive Holmes. It involves taking a drug called Etanercept, usually used to treat the painful symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. And you may well ask why. For 30 years, there's been a small rump of skeptical scientists who've refused to believe amyloid is the main culprit in Alzheimer's disease. Until the 1980s, it was believed the brain had no immune system at all, that it was an immune-privileged organ. But some of these scientists discovered that brain cells called microglia, uh, formerly thought to be just structural elements in the brain, were the equivalent of macrophages in the peripheral circulation, capable of churning out uh, um, pro-inflammatory cytokine messenger molecules like interleukin-1, and interleukin-6, just as does the innate immune system in the rest of the body as it fights infections. This inflammatory behavior preceded the buildup of amyloid, suggesting that amyloid was the result of immune system activity rather than the primary cause of Alzheimer's disease. Clive remembers attending a lecture by one of these skeptics, Patrick McGear, in the late 1990s on the links between inflammation and Alzheimer's. And it rang bells with him because many of the Alzheimer's patients he was dealing with reported that infections made their condition worse. He went home and teamed up with an experimental neuropathologist, Hugh Perry, and they uh, did a joint experiment with 300 patients where they measured cytokine levels in the blood and interviewed them about their history of infections. And they discovered that those patients who had chronic inflammatory diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and arthritis were declining four times faster, faster than Alzheimer's disease patients uh, that were in better health. And those patients with a background of inflammatory illness and an occasional spike of a recent infection superimposed upon it were declining tenfold. Now, these results confirm to Holmes and Perry that states of peripheral infection and inflammation with their raised levels of circulating inflammatory cytokines were able to communicate with the brain. However, at the time, it was heresy to suggest that the immune system could speak to the brain and affect its chemistry or behavior. 
Psychoneuroimmunology, as it was then known, was marginalized science, Hugh Perry told me, because people felt that if you called yourself a neuroimmunologist, it just meant you were a crap neuroscientist or a crap immunologist. So if you now added psycho to all that, well, it meant you didn't understand a damn thing. <laughs> However, Perry happened to meet the chief European exponent of this crap science, Robert Dancer, at a scientific meeting in France. And Dancer told him about a 30-year evolutionary theory, 30-year-old evolutionary theory called sickness behavior, which sought to explain the relationship between fever and illness and the almost hibernatory behavior of animals when in the throes of recovery from infection or poisoning. The author of sickness behavior theory in the early 1980s was a veterinary scientist at the University of California in Davis called Benjamin Hart. Hart observed that both animals and people at the onset of a severe infection run a fever, but also tend to become lethargic, depressed, and anorexic. They prefer a burrow or a bed to the office or a foraging run outdoors. The sleepiness and depression cuts down activity and channels valuable energy into stoking the fever. And since it's well known that pathogens prefer temperatures lower than that of the human body. Sickness behavior, said Hart, is an organized, evolved behavioral strategy to facilitate the role of fever in combating viral and bacterial infections. Hart specifically identified pro-inflammatory cytokines as capable of causing the fever as they incited macrophages to converge on the pathogen and destroy it, and suggested those same cytokines could communicate with the brain to elicit the depression and appetite loss that attended the fever. Dancer modernized Hart's theory by explaining precisely how those signals of infection in the periphery could communicate with the brain to induce sleepiness, social withdrawal, depression, loss of appetite, fatigue, and aching joints. But crucially, he also asked what happens when the acute sickness response is no longer adaptive, either because it's out of proportion with the set of causal factors that were the trigger for it, or because it goes on for too long, as would occur if you were suffering from a variety of chronic inflammatory illnesses. He specifically cites depression and Alzheimer's disease as two likely repercussions of sickness behavior becoming maladaptive. Sickness behavior has given Holmes and Perry a solid evolutionary context for their hypothesis that infection and inflammation in the body can raise cytokine levels in the periphery and communicate that state to the brain um, to initiate a similar inflammation there. And they hypothesized that repeated inflammatory signals prime microglia so that they overreact and start damaging neurons. Their model for Alzheimer's disease has just been robustly supported by Irene Neussel and Dmitri Kristic from Switzerland using a recognized mouse model for Alzheimer's disease. Neussel injected pregnant mice with a chemical called poly-IC, which of course is a viral mimic. It caused chronic raised inflammatory cytokine levels in the brains of the fetuses, a reduction in the growth and development of neurons as those fetuses matured, and a significant increase in the precursor of beta amyloid in the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain responsible for learning and memory and the first to go in Alzheimer's disease. They also identified active microglia in the hippocampus. Well, things became even more interesting when they gave a second dose of poly-IC during adulthood to mice that had previously been challenged in the womb. This mimicked an adult systemic infection. They discovered widespread changes in both size and morphology of microglia, especially in the hippocampus, which suggested they had indeed become primed. And they also found pronounced amyloid plaques in the double immune challenged mice compared with controls. What they'd done was to have produced a comprehensive mouse model of Alzheimer's where the sequence of events ran from infection to inflammation in the brain, an exaggerated response of microglia, damaged neurons, accumulation of phosphorylated tau inside neurons, and accumulation of amyloid plaques between them. Their model of Alzheimer's disease has completely reversed the arrow of causation making infection and inflammation the prime movers. 
And only a few weeks ago, a colleague of Holmes and Perry at the University of Southampton, Diego Gomez Nicola, published yet more research that vindicates this inflammation theory. He found that microglia were far more numerous in the brains of patients who died from Alzheimer's disease than in age-matched controls. Furthermore, in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, he showed that by chemically blocking the receptor that determines microglia number, he could not only obviously prevent the rise in microglia numbers, but also prevent the loss of connections between neurons and produce mice with fewer memory and behavioral problems, even though their brains were full of, you've guessed it, amyloid. All this research makes complete sense of several retrospective trials in the US in the late 1990s, which suggested that the long-term taking of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and aspirin helped to prevent Alzheimer's. The biggest study was done by the Veterans Administration, and it compared 50,000 former servicemen who had subsequently contracted Alzheimer's with 200,000 that remained undemented. The data revealed that taking ibuprofen for five years or more had more than halved their risk. Now there's a final evolutionary twist to this story of Alzheimer's disease. Humans are the only species that suffers from late onset Alzheimer's disease, the kind that accounts for 99% of all cases. A gene, CD33, has been discovered that determines whether or not microglia perform a benign protective role or an aggressive role that can lead to Alzheimer's pathology. Levels of CD33 protein and numbers of CD33 producing microglia are increased as Alzheimer's develops. Microglia, as well as producing cytokines as part of the inflammatory response, are also the innate immune system's scavenging cells in the brain. They'll gobble up cell debris, damaged and dying neurons, and beta amyloid. But when CD33 is active, those microglia stop their benign housekeeping and become inflammatory and neurotoxic and stop gobbling up rubbish. Ajit and Nisi Vaki and Pascal Gagneau in San Diego have recently estimated that the CD33 gene rose to prominence in humans after the split with the common ancestor with chimpanzees six or seven million years ago. I think it's a classic example of what I call the live now, pay later phenomenon, otherwise known as antagonistic pleiotropy. There must be something extremely useful to young human brains that warrants the evolution of a gene that increases inflammation via innate immune system activity while simultaneously decreasing the removal of beta amyloid from the brain. And the suggestion is that CD33 evolved to help protect young brains in individuals with a full reproductive life ahead of them from head injury and microbial brain infections, even though in older post-reproductive age it carries the risk of dementia. Now there's also a variant of this CD33 gene that reduces the amount of CD33 uh, protein that it manufactures and is therefore protective against Alzheimer's. It occurs at low frequency in balance with these more toxic variants of CD33 in all human populations examined. Varki argues that this protective variant was derived quite recently much less than half a million years ago, and suggests it could have evolved because early human populations increasingly needed grandparents to survive into old age and still be on top of their cognitive game. Capable of looking after grandchildren and contributing knowledge and wisdom to younger generations, rather than simply being a senile burden on them. Capable grandparents would have aided the youngsters' survival and crucially, the survival of grandparental genes in them. So kin selection, Varki says, might have been just strong enough to maintain this balance between the gene variant for extended post-reproductive lifespan and the variant that mitigates against old age in favor of an aggressive, innate immune system during youth. All this evolution-inspired research is beginning to force a re-examination of, of the amyloid hypothesis, because it's no longer as obvious as it once appeared to be exactly where beta amyloid fits. 
It could be a primary or secondary toxic factor. It could be just the rubble left over from an, 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 the effects of an immune system gone haywire. Or it could even be a complete distraction. We need to acknowledge that beta amyloid in appropriate concentrations isn't pathogenic, pathogenic at all, but has important evolved functions in the brain. It's absolutely vital for regulating the traffic of signals across networks of neurons, supporting long-term potentiation by which memories are stored and formed, and preventing the overexcitability of neuronal networks which we might experience as fits or seizures. There's even emerging evidence that beta amyloid is a powerful antimicrobial agent which may have evolved in the brain to protect it against infections. Drugs that inhibit the formation of amyloid, if they can ever be made to work, may do, therefore, more harm than good. We urgently need, I think, more quality research into the gene we do know can increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease more than 16 times, if you're homozygous for it. It's called APOE Epsilon 4, and so overpowering is the amyloid hypothesis that this gene, which you might have thought would have been an obvious target for research, has been relatively neglected. However, we do know that this variant impairs transports of lipids that are essential for neuronal health, it's linked to preclinical uh, cognitive decline, and it can increase inflammation in the brain by stimulating primed toxic microglia. I think we urgently need to pursue these alternative avenues, like infection and inflammation to get to the bottom of what really fires up Alzheimer's disease. It's a disease that claims an Amer another American every 68 seconds. It really is a medical time bomb, and I think it does threaten to engulf us. We can't just stand by and watch it ticking. We've lost too much time already. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Before we take questions, two quick announcements. One, we'd like everyone to exit this way with your plates because the garbage cans are there. And second, there are people out there ready to sell you a book if you're interested in learning the rest of the story. And we would like you to use this microphone asking questions so the people on the video can hear the questions. Who's first? Hi. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between early cognitive decline and inflammation? So before people get to the stage that they really have dementia, they oftentimes report sort of early stage things that they don't. Well, I, I can't talk very much about that because actually there's not very much to say. This is, of course, the big problem. And um, she was just saying, can I uh, talk to the... Um, the idea of um, cognitive decline, uh, early stages of cognitive decline, um, before f full scale pathology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, th the problem is that, uh, uh, this is the big problem. You can replace um, uh, immune action and inflammation as the driving force of Alzheimer's and uh, disregard amyloid, but you're still faced with the same problem. When does it start and what actually you know, kicks it off? And the trouble with Alzheimer's disease is that it's, it starts um, certainly two decades, and it could even be more, before you get any possible idea, well, before you actually sort of are wandering on and you suddenly forget which parking lot you left your car in, you know. Um, it, it's, it's a real problem. And nobody has done anything in the way of a breakthrough to find some kind of a, a test or a biological marker that can suggest things are going wrong. I mean, I would suggest, from, what, uh, from following the logic that I've tried to put in front of you guys today, is that you know, by looking at um, peripheral inflammation and inflammation markers in cerebrospinal fluid or something like that, you may well be able to see something like C-reactive protein at rather unhealthy levels or interleukin-1 if you can afford to assay for it or whatever. 
um, as a result of perhaps what might have been quite early challenges from infections early on in life. Um, but you know, the trouble is that, you know, um, as I say, by the, uh, the, the thought is that young people, that this can actually start quite early on. But because you're making neurons and building synapses when you're young as fast as you're losing them, it doesn't show up as any obvious cognitive deficit. It's only when you get to my age. Uh, at his age, that, um, that, <laughs> that things, you know, start to unravel. Uh, but the, 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 there's no answer out there, I think. Thank you. Um, my question is also about the, the um, inflammation hypothesis around Alzheimer's. The part I don't get is that, you know, you showed the cascade still ending up with deposition of amyloid plaque. And I think you started out the whole story by saying that some people die in their 70s and 80s loaded with amyloid and with great cognition. So are you suggesting that there's, this is only one of several pathways that can lead to the deposition no. of amyloid plaque? No, what I'm saying is it might be irrelevant, but it does lead to the deposition of amyloid plaque. Um, and that actually uh, Alzheimer's disease is a disease of neurons rather than a disease of amyloid. And that other processes are involved in doing the initial damage to neurons. So it may Unless be there's another way that amyloid can be laid down, I don't see how someone could die with, uh, loaded with amyloid and good cognition if it was developed, you know, if it was a result of this uh, infl inflammatory um, well, uh, stimulation. Only, only if you assume that amyloid is, that that amyloid, when it builds up, is toxic. But as the, as the model of those, those two studies show. The, the, the inflammation preceded the amyloid yeah. in, your, in your diagram. It does. So I'm not assuming the amyloid is toxic. I'm, I'm assuming that that the central tenet of the theory, which is that the inflammation causes neuronal damage before leading to the deposition. That's the toxic event, is the way I... Yes, no, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, things come in cycles. There was work done 30 years ago, uh, which showed that, um, you know, uh, neuron and synapse loss was far uh, more, far heavily associated with Alzheimer's disease than any level of amyloid deposition. But of course, you know, time rumbles on these, you know, the, these, ex I mean, this guy won um, a, no a Nobel Prize or a very significant science prize for, for, for coming up with this. And you would, you know, the sands of time have just blown completely over it. But, you know, that's been out there, you know, for decades. So uh, I, I really appreciate your inflammatory story. I've been doing uh, inflammation and Alzheimer's research for the past decade. Um, with Joseph Rogers, uh, among others, uh, that have looked at inflammation in the brain. Uh, we've tried uh, endomethacin trials and human studies, and they have failed, uh, mainly because of the dosage needed to be so high to have an effect that the uh, patients were actually dying. So that was one failure. But we do, when we look at microglia and culture that we isolate from human brain, uh, when we do uh, um, endomethacin treatment, things like this, they, uh, it inhibits their migration to amyloid plaques, which is, uh, you know, releases pro-inflammatory cytokines, et cetera. <clears throat> so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work uh, that's been done already in inflammation and Alzheimer's disease, and, and, and not only Alzheimer's, but uh, Parkinson's, among other neurodegenerative Absolutely, diseases. Absolutely, yes. You know, yeah. so I mean, this is just one of many. I mean, there are a lot of have major neurodegenerative um, inflammatory component. Um, you well, know, it's uh, true. There are a variety of, of yeah, different types pretty, of dementia. Pretty much, pretty much if I, all if of I them. come over there and give you a big bang on the head, your beta amyloid levels are going to yeah, go shooting up. Yeah, know? so and I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> inflammation, you know, environment, yeah. um, you know, and uh, so it's. I, I really appreciate this talk. I think it, it there's there's uh, lends credence to where we need to go. I think in the future, as far as uh, inflammatory responses, etc. In fact. Uh, our, uh, we have a blood diagnostic test that we just did, we just patent, uh, and that the, uh, the strongest uh, correlate to disease pathogenesis from a, from a cohort that never had disease that we followed over a period of time to finally getting Alzheimer's disease, the, the, the strongest transcripts that we found to be changed were those associated with inflammation. Absolutely. And, uh, Pretty sensitive, about a 95% sensitivity, and over almost like a 99.9 .9 specificity, we could tell you whether you're going to get Alzheimer's disease if you have expressed in these specific transcripts at a certain age, uh, 65 and on. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of truth. Well, in this. just listening to you uh, reminds me of 
uh, something Julie Williams from the University of Cardiff. She was the one who was the mastermind of two of those um, uh, genome-wide association studies that I alluded to earlier yeah. in the talk. And she, just, she, she said, um, I'm not telling you that the amyloid hypothesis is complete crap, because I honestly don't know that. But yeah. what, she, what she does say is there's this unhealthy, massive spotlight on the amyloid hypothesis. Yeah. And she just wants that to be taken and shone elsewhere. That was you know, her turn of phrase. Um, and I think that's, you know, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to yeah, say I think that's a know, really, enough already. Uh, yeah. that's, 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 a, that's a really good idea. It's a good direction to go to. Yeah. And I think it'll help many neurodegenerative diseases, not just Alzheimer's and other Absolutely. inflammatory diseases yeah, as well. Yeah. 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 So yeah. very nice, very nice talk. Very articulate. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry. One over here. Perhaps a comment as much as a question. The poly IC experiments are very interesting. Um, poly IC is a very good inducer of interferon. And humans treated with interferon for hepatitis C go through massive depression to the point of suicide. And so clearly interferon can be uh, psychoactive. And so I guess the, the question is, has anybody looked at, in mice we have many parts of the interferon system knocked out. And uh, has anybody looked at the effects of that on uh, um, any models for Alzheimer's? I can't tell you. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. there's a literature there. I'm not aware of it. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not either. <laughs> no, but uh, as it happens, I don't. One more question? Good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.